Great. So, um, as part of the uh, the climate climate recon project, we also wanted to look at the uh, LTSs across the whole of the EU on a specific topic. And um, I know the YZ Europa have done this already for for, for the gas for the uh, for gas natural gas. Um, and uh, we decided to look at uh, basically the carbon sinks that, or what countries are saying about carbon sinks from both the natural and artificial perspective. Because um, as we know, to reach climate neutrality, you, or it's essentially impossible to reduce some emissions. And so you need to have some sense of uh, negative emissions that can act to counteract the emissions that you do have. Um, and this can be, in two ways, it can be either natural sinks, so LULUCEF essentially, and then also within the last, I don't know, decade or so, people have been talking more and more about technological removals in the form of uh, carbon capture and storage or uh, direct air capture, this kind of thing. So, so we kind of wanted to look at both of them and how they were incorporated in the different strategies. Um, and when I was researching this, uh, I found that the, there was a report actually in 2021 that the, I think the EU commissioned, which was looking across the whole region at different uh, scientific publications and seeing what kind of the storage rates and the sequestration rates were from different kinds of land types. And we see um, what I think kind of probably people know or, or at least suspect is that uh, forests generally have very high sequestration rates um, and, and wetlands have very high carbon stock rates, but uh, a bit lower sequestration rates. Um, but there is quite a high heterogeneity across different regions and across different studies. So not all forests are the same, for instance, and it's not just the case that you can have uh, really high sequestration if you have lots of forests. Um, and yeah, this kind of is, is summarized, or, or what they found also is summarized here, that generally um, with... Uh, just uh, I don't know if I need the speaker to... The, yeah. Gen generally with forests um, or, or trees, then faster growing species absorb more carbon. And this is in fact something that I think it was published last year or the year before in Nature Climate Change that uh, trees are tending to absorb carbon quicker because of this CO2 fertilization, because there's more in the atmosphere. But then as a consequence of that, they're also dying quicker. So the, the long-term sink effects are not maybe as, uh, as pronounced as we could have hoped for. And um, in order to store carbon from faster growing species for a long time, then sustainable wood use in long-lived products is, is, is maybe the way that you can do that. But when it comes to storing carbon in forests for a long time, then the studies tend to show that unmanaged forests that store carbon slowly generally keep it for a longer time. And what the studies also show with wetlands is that you can um, restore wetlands, but it takes quite a long time for the carbon to replenish. So in that sense, it's much better to conserve what you have, then lose it and then restore it again. Um, and in the context of, of, of LULICEF and natural sinks at the EU level, uh, I'll go very quickly through this because of, 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 of time shortages, uh, we find that emissions kind of removals cover about 10% of, of total emissions. And of course, for t this to reach carbon neutrality, a uh, climate neutrality, it will have to be 100%. So there's quite a long way to go. Um, and when we look at the LULUCEF sector in particular, we find that it has been decreasing since around 20 or 2009. And indeed, it is projected to kind of stay the same or even decrease slightly in the near future. And that nearly all of the sequestration is basically from, from, from forests. You can see that the rate of absorption really accurately is kind of tracking the uh, rate of absorption in forests. And if you take that away, you kind of have net emissions from all of the sub of other subsectors, apart from uh, uh, harvested wood products. Um, yeah, and this is just to show that, that, uh, that, that there's something of a correlation between the absorption in forests and the absorption in LULUCEF sectors. Um, but going beyond that, we can also say that not all forests are the same because you can look at the case of Estonia, which has had a really high uh, land area of forests, but is now a, a net uh, emitter in the LULUCEF sector. Um, and then also we can look at sort of what the Fit for 55 targets say um, in terms of sequestration. So it should be 
increased up to 2030 to 310 megaton, uh, megatons of CO2, and, and this is also at um, a country level. Um, I just put them all on a graph there, what the different countries uh, have been told to achieve within this. And also, um, by 2035, the combined land sector, so LULICEF and agriculture, should be climate neutral. Um, and then also one thing that we found is that the EU reference scenarios now have projections for, for, for LULUCEF. And this is quite interesting because we can see um, when we compare these to the actual emissions from 2020 for the, the decades that follow, there are certain sinks that are projected to increase a lot. So for instance, Germany and others that are predicted to stay roughly the same. So, so, so Sweden, I think Spain also. But then there are also some that are... Um, under the EU reference scenario is not really projected to, to, to increase at all. And in fact, if you look at Estonia, it's, it's still actually projected to be a net um, emitter by 2050. Um, and when it comes to technological sinks, we kind of define two different types. So you can think of it conceptually that there are forms of carbon capture that are there, that they, they inherently remove carbon from the atmosphere. That's things like bioenergy with carbon capture and storage and direct air capture. But then there are also ones which are um, simply reducing the amount of emissions that might be caused by something. So that's classic carbon capture and storage just comes from a point source where you can remove emissions from say natural gas, but that's never gonna be 100% effective. So we're talking about removals, but it's kind of removals in an artificial sense because it's not actually removing anything from the atmosphere. It's emitting things to the atmosphere, just less that would be emitted if you didn't have the CCS. Um, and when uh, you look kind of at both of these in terms of what the EU has said, you find that uh, all of the 1.5 scenarios that they published in this Clean Planet for All document include uh, both, uh, both types of technological sinks to quite a high extent. So 500 megatons of CO2 should be captured or, or stored in 2050 for a, a 1.5 degree warming scenario. So, so climate neutrality by 2050. Um, that was just a bit of background. So then to look at natural carbon sinks in, in the long-term strategies. Uh, the first thing we wanted to kind of do is to understand based on the targets that countries have given. So they've, they've said that they want to have climate neutrality, but they've also quite often had to have a real or implied target for the amount of emission, direct emissions reductions they want to do. So that might be a level of 85 or 90%. And then implicit to that is then the, that they then need natural sinks to account for say 10% of their emissions. So what we tried to do is see if we can estimate what the minimum sink sizes are for each country in the EU that has um, submitted a long-term strategy, and, and also the ones that haven't, in fact. So we did that kind of in as standardized way as we could. We basically took the value if they were specifying it, which was not super often, based on, uh, uh, on the most ambitious climate neutrality modeling scenario that they would give. If they didn't do that, then we would take what their reduction target was, excluding LULUCEF, and take what is left as the LULUCEF sink. So quite often they might say, we want to achieve climate neutrality, but we also want to reduce emissions by 90% in other sectors. So then you know that uh, carbon sink should account for 10%. And uh, if they were less ambitious than climate neutrality, then we would just add on the extra emissions. So if they said they wanted to reduce emissions, including LULUCEF by 90%, then we would add the 10% of emissions on. If they didn't give any targets at all, then we wanted to still say something about those countries. And then we found that the average kind of reductions that countries were talking about was 85%. So that's what we used kind of for those countries. Like if they were to follow what other countries are doing and reduce their emissions by 85%, then their, the sinks that they would need would be 15%. So then we can at least say something about them. And for a few countries that were really comprehensive in their LTSs, they would also say the level of technological removal. So for instance, Hungary did this. And uh, we didn't really, we wanted to talk about what the size of the sink they would need anyway. So if they gave us that value, then we would add it back on. And the other thing to say is there are many uncertainties in this. The EU reference scenarios, I think, are maybe not the best thing to use as the projections of the sinks in 2050. But the reason we did is because it establishes a baseline for every country 
it's the same methodology for every country. So what I'm going to show is not necessarily super accurate, but it at least provides kind of a, a, a baseline or some sort of idea of where countries stand on this. Uh, and here I've just list, listed what the targets that we used for every country were in terms of uh, what their reductions were. So you can see for the Baltic states, they're in red. And you can see that it is pretty often the case that it's around 85% when we're looking at the targets or the modeling. And so some are more ambitious, um, like Germany had a range of 80 to 95%, which is really, really big. And we, we took the most ambitious in that case. And when we did this, we can see that um, we can compare what the projected LULUCEF sink is from the EU reference scenarios against what the minimum re requirements would be for that country. And we can present this in a bar chart, which just shows the two bars, or we can present it as a ratio. Um, for some countries, the projected LULUCEF sink is going to be, or was projected to be positive in 2050. So then instead of doing a ratio, we uh, used the magnitude of the difference between the two sinks and then use that as the numerator in the ratio. Um, and you can see that there's really, really big differences between different countries. So Sweden and Finland, the projected LULUCEF sink is going to be bigger than what they require for climate neutrality. But on the other hand, you have Estonia, which is really, really far away because the sink is projected to be a net emitter still in 2050. And uh, we, we took the assumption that they were going to reduce emissions by 85%. So then that leaves 15% of emissions in 1990 that have to be compensated. And that, that's really far away if your sink is going to be positive. Um, and then we could kind of group countries into three different categories. So the on-track ones are the ones where the size of the projected sink is bigger than what they would need to do to achieve cl climate neutrality. And there are only three countries that fall into that category. And one of them, Spain, has specifically said that they need to use carbon capture and storage. So if you're looking purely at natural sinks, there are only two countries that are going to, based on this very, very simple analysis, uh, be able to do that um, uh, based on their projected sinks in 2050. Then we have a lot of countries kind of where the sink projected size is within a factor of two of what the sink they would need to have in 2050 is. So Lithuania is in this category. Um, and we put this category there because we know that this uh, projection of uh, climate um, natural sinks under a baseline scenario is, is really, really variable. So I think the uncertainty of a factor of two is, is not so big. But then there are these countries, a huge group of countries whose projected sink in 2050 is more than a factor of two smaller than what they would need to reach climate neutrality under their um, targets or models. Um, and, and Latvia and Estonia in that category. Um, yeah, so I kind of put these together. Um, and of the countries that are really far away, you can kind of think of them as in three different categories. You have small, densely populated countries like Malta and Belgium, who say in their long-term strategies that they don't have much room for afforestation. Um, and it's really difficult to know how countries like that are going to reach climate neutrality unless they use uh, technological uh, solutions because they don't really have much option to increase their natural sinks. But then at the same time, they're still saying that they're going to have outstanding emissions of 10 or 5 or 15 or 20% in 2050. Then you have countries like Estonia and Latvia um, who have more potential, I would say, to increase the size of their carbon sinks because they have lots of forested land, their population densities are a little bit lower, but their sinks are projected to go the wrong way. So it's more, there's more potential there. And then you also have countries in a third category, like the Republic of Ireland or Denmark, whose sinks have essentially since 1990 always been positive. And again, within their borders, if they're targeting a reduction of 85%, say, in uh, emissions by 2050, it's really un difficult to understand how they are going to, again, reach climate neutrality um, without relying quite significantly on technological uh, solutions. Uh, and then we, having done that, looked more at what they are actually saying in terms of the LULUCEF sectors. So kind of you could group how they've incorporated this into three different uh, 
groups. So you have countries that are talking about LULUCEF as a separate sector, which is the majority. You have a few countries that have integrated it with agriculture. And then you have a few countries that are not talking about it at all. So the three that I found were Denmark, Greece, and the Netherlands. They, they, they don't talk about LULUCEF at all. And then um, you can also talk about some of the common aspects that they were talking about. So I think I've probably missed some, but essentially nearly every country aside from the ones that, didn't, that said they didn't have the space to do it, are talking about afforestation or reforestation. Quite a lot of them are talking about land planning. So by 2050, saying that there'll be no net land use change towards settlements. And quite a lot of them are also talking about improved monitoring. And, and the reason for this is because um, I think estimating em emissions in the LULUCEF sector is, uh, is really the hardest. So this was also a common theme that we saw quite a lot, that countries want to improve them sort of capacity to, to understand what kind of uh, emissions they have from specific regions inside the LULUCEF sector. Uh, and th they were three just kind of commonalities that I picked out straight away. Um, and then to look more specifically at forestry, like I said, nearly all countries call for improved forest management or sustainable forestry, but uh, specifics are often la lacking behind then. That, and a couple of countries call into question this um, idea of the stability of their forests long term. So on the right is some modelling from uh, the Austrian LTS based on four different, or is it five, five different scenarios which look at different kind of wood use, like really um, exploiting wood really, really extensively in the country or, or the green curve at the bottom is not exploiting it very much at all. And what they found is that by... 2100, even when they're not really exploiting, and this, this is specific to Austria, of course, if they're um, not really exploiting wood at all, the size of their sink is still going to decrease and become almost zero by 2100. So there's also this question, I think, in terms of how long-term any uh, sink can be, depending on the, the circumstances of a specific country and, and what the, the, the sector is like there and whether it is instead just kind of like a, a debit for the future, that the emissions are being removed for a period of time, but not indefinitely. Um, and linked into that is this uh, idea of adaptation, because the LULUCEF sector is one that is going to be really affected by changing climate. Um, and in fact, in a lot of cases, this might lead to a weakening of sink sizes. So for instance, in Portugal and Spain, they both talk quite a lot about... Um, trying to find ways to manage the risks of forest fires or uh, countries such as, I think, Luxembourg spent a long time talking about trying to reduce bark beetle infestations because these are kind of climate change factors which are going to really weaken the strength, the size of their, of their sinks. Um, and I, yeah, I just pick out a few different examples based on, on this here, but I, I think for, for, for brevity, we should go a bit <coughs> faster. Um, in terms of other land use categories, yeah, a lot of countries are talking about restoring and protecting peatlands and wetlands. And uh, some countries also talk about um, storing of carbon in agricultural soils, which is another thing to kind of draw out in this analysis that we found is that um, it's really difficult to draw this boundary around LULUCEF because it has so many intersections of so many other sectors, like with the agriculture sector and then and then issues to do with kind of how much wood you're using, like bioresources. Um, and, then, and then if you have an expanding population, you have this issue of, 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 of pressure coming from uh, urbanization, say. So yeah, it's um, something that's really complicated. <laughs> um, and then as part of that, we wanted to look kind of more specifically at the area of bioresources um, and what countries are saying about how much they want to exploit kind of these in terms of uh, traditional materials, a sort of wood for energy or wood for construction, but then also sometimes they're talking about kind of uh, new materials. So kind of this um, um, more, let's say, high-tech uses where you can use sort of the, 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 the biopolymers uh, as the building blocks for replacement of, of f f materials that are derived from fossil fuels like this bio bioplastics kind of kind of sector. Um, yeah, and uh, Greece is the one country that clearly states that developing the bioeconomy is a priority, but almost all countries also talk about the increasing use of bioresources to different extents. And this is something else that's really important because it's something that could, in principle, also put 
pressure on the size of the expected carbon sinks of these countries if it's if it's not done in a in a strategic way. Uh, Italy puts emphasis on regenerative bioeconomy, so the regeneration of soils, CO2, um, from the atmosphere. Um, a lot of countries are talking about the hierarchy of sustainability, but not all of them. So this is the idea that it's better to first use wood in long-lived products because, simply put, you're then um, keeping the carbon locked up for a longer time. Um, and this was talked about by, by France, Belgium, Germany, Croatia, the Czech Republic and Luxembourg. And uh, France was one country which really kind of called into question the stability of their carbon sink in, in, in forests long term. And they said that um, in order to manage this, they need to triple the production of these products between 2015 and, 2015 and 2050. Um, on the other hand, Greece was a country that we really noticed is really, really talking about the use of um, bioresources for any energy production. I think um, they stipulate how much land use they want to use for this. And if you compare that to the land area of Greece, it's something like four or five percent, which is, is really a lot because uh, land use is a zero sum game. And if you want to use land for something else, for something, then you can't use it for anything else, really. Um, use of biomass and district heating is also predicted to increase, but the, the use by private households is, is going to decrease. Um, and yeah, that, that's because of uh, a lot of the, the negative sort of um, air pollution impacts that we know about. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, a lot of countries also talk about um, the transport sector and kind of bioenergy as being a, um, a key possibility for decarbonizing transport sectors that are difficult to decarbonize in other ways like aviation and shipping. Um, and yeah, then to come on to the con conflicts, um, Developing of the bioeconomy does often resu result in greater land use, and then that land can't be used for anything else. So the Czech Republic says that uh, there is potential for 680,000 hectares of arable land and 400,000 hectares of permanent grassland for biomass. Uh, Denmark plans to simultaneously increase the share of forests and bioenergy-based electricity production, and Italy says they want to fully exploit the potential of biomass while emphasizing the importance of sustainable forest management. So the kind of a, quite a lot of these um, conflicts in the strategies which uh, might cause problems in the future if they want to, on the one hand, increase the use of bioresources and on the other hand, maintain the size of the, the carbon sink. Of, of course, these things don't necessarily have to be contradictory, but they, they can be contradictory, I think. Uh, and then we also looked at the, the technological carbon sinks and the national long-term strategies, which were included in a few strategies to quite a great extent, and others not so much so. So um, this map I showed is basically our assessment of uh, how promising uh, or otherwise countries see uh, carbon capture and storage and carbon capture and utilization. And you can see, actually, I think half or just over half of the countries um, are either stating directly or implicitly stating that they would like to uh, use these technologies or develop an infrastructure by which they could use them. And then you have other countries um, which are not stating that, but are stating it a bit more ambiguously, like they would potentially like to use them, uh, but they're, they're not sure. And then in terms of countries that are quite strongly against, uh, there was only a few of them that we could pick out. So. Latvia say in their strategy that they, they, they don't say directly that they don't want to use these technologies, but they say that uh, there's no capacity for carbon storage in Latvia in a cost-effective manner. So based on no, other in, no additional information, we concluded that, the, that they're not planning on using it. And Portugal, I think, are another country that came out really, really strongly um, against the use of uh, CCS and CCU. Um, and when we look at the industry that countries are talking about using this for, it's uh, yeah mainly cement and steel, which uh, is obvious. I mean, these are these are very difficult things to de decarbonize. Um, and then I've just highlighted again uh, what a few different countries are saying about this. So Hungary is quite pro CCS, and they actually included in both of their neutrality scenarios a high use of uh, CCS post 20 mainly post-2040, but a little bit in 2030, to uh, reduce by 10 megatons um, uh, carbon that would be emitted. 
and they actually also specify which different sectors they were going to use that for, and to some extent they specify what they will use the captured carbon for. Um, like we've talked about, the Hungarian strategy is actually really comprehensive. Portugal, on the other hand, also spend quite a lot of time talking about these technologies, but they're quite strongly against it because they don't see it as very cost effective and the only um, sector that they could see it being used for in their country is cement. But they think that by 2050, the cement sector would have changed so much anyway that, it, that it, the impact of it won't be very low. Uh, finally, France talk about using it a lot for storage rather than utilization. Um, and they give specific values for the storage that they can use, uh, which I talk about in the next slide, that a lot of countries are talking about wanting to use these technologies, but they um, are not sure yet or haven't done the analysis as to what the capacity they will have in their country is. There were only, as far as I could tell, three um, explicit values from countries where they stated this is what we think our capacity for carbon storage is and that was Austria, France and Greece. But uh, 10 of the 20 countries nonetheless viewed these technologies as positive in our assessment. Uh, and then to move to, move to diffuse removals, um, bioenergy and carbon capture and storage is, is viewed, uh, is included much more often than uh, direct air capture. Um, and we didn't really uh, even find any mentions to any of the other um, removal technologies. Um, but the amount of information is, is generally much uh, lower than it is for CCS and CCU. So Finland and France both included uh, quantitative values for BEX that they want to remove. Um, or would potentially do in the Finnish case because it was included in one of their two uh, climate neutrality scenarios, whereas the other one didn't, didn't use it. Um, but yeah, it was included much less than, uh, than CCS and CCU. So it's interesting that countries are looking at techniques that will allow them to continue to use fossil fuels but reduce their impact rather than techniques that might help to uh, remove further carbon from the atmosphere. And yeah, with direct air capture, it was included very rarely. The Netherlands said that uh, it will be necessary and, and, and the amount that they as a country will have to remove should be determined on a global level. Um, and then there were a few of uh, references to this, but that was all. Uh, yeah, and a final thing I wanted to mention is that no country talked about sequestration from marine environments at all, despite the fact that uh, this can in some cases be quite significant. Um, uh, based on the same uh, EU report, uh, the, the, the levels of sequestration and the carbon stocks are not always so small. So it, it's something else, I don't know if it's classically even covered by LULUCEF or not, but it, it's something else that countries could in the future talk about. Uh, so to conclude, um, we did a very simple analysis of the projected sink size based on EU reference scenarios against what countries are stating is necessary for climate neutrality. And based on this uh, very simple analysis, I, I think there are quite a lot of problems with these EU reference scenarios for 2050, but very few countries are on track to have a sufficient sink to reach climate neutrality by 2050. Um, for some countries, um, I, I think particularly Malta, um, but there are other countries, it's really difficult to know how they can achieve territorial climate neutrality because of, uh, of the specific uh, circumstances of that country. Um, where countries are talking about measures to uh, increase their uh, carbon sinks, then, then of course they're talking about afforestation. Often, um, few countries actually give specific details of how much or what they're trying to do, but they all talk about it quite a lot. Um, but a few also highlight the instability of the carbon sink, both um, due to natural changes and those effect that come about because of changes to the climate. Um, most countries at the same time is talking about this are also talking about wanting to exploit bioresources and, and use the bioeconomy more. Um, and this is done for quite a lot of countries through um, this hierarchy of use where it's first used in uh, long-lived products, so in construction, for instance, where the carbon is locked up for a long term, but a few are also talking about using it um, from, from a bioenergy perspective and the replacement of fossil fuels in that way. 
uh, more than half of countries to look at technological sinks are talking about using CS, CCS and CCU. Um, and this has included much more than countries talking about uh, the direct removal of emissions through BEX or DAC. Um, but one thing that I would finally highlight there is that countries don't always make this distinction clear. Sometimes they talk about CCS and then you find later in the document that it's, it's, it's coming from, uh, from, from wood, so it's really BEX. And, and I think countries can make this distinction clear because in terms of, uh, uh, like on a conceptual level, they're actually really, really different, I think, because one is leading to increased emissions just less than there would be otherwise, whereas the other is, is uh, despite, I think, kind of the uh, well-known criticisms of it uh, in terms of land use is, is actually uh, avoiding, avoiding emissions. So yeah, uh, that's why I should also say that this analysis is not finished. We, uh, we still have a little bit of, of, of uh, work to do to finish, so this is kind of an intermediate series of conclusions, but yeah, that is what we found.